Good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining session three of the Indiana Corn and Soybean Forum. Uh, this year, we're spreading the forum out over the week. And Monday, we heard uh, from our uh, director of the State Department of Agriculture, Bruce Kettler, as well as we got an update from American Soybean Association on what's going on in Washington. And yesterday, we joined the Midwest Pork Conference and got an update on our strategic strategic plans and heard from farmers on the efforts uh, that we're pursuing on the checkoff, uh, both corn and soybean checkoff. And today we're going to cover biofuels issues. Uh, my name is Steve House, Senior, Senior Director of Industry Affairs for the Corn Growers Association, the Corn Marketing Council, as well as uh, the Indiana Soybean Alliance. Uh, we're going to hear from Elena Jetty, uh, Director of Biofuels for, uh, for Corn and Soy. And she's going to have a chat with Casey's General Stores uh, VP of Fuels, Nathaniel Doddridge. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some state uh, legislation. There's some gas hall updates that are needed. And I'll cover a little bit of that and then give it a little feel of what we think is going to happen in session. And then we're also going to hear from Kathy Berggren, Director of uh, Public Policy and Renewable Fuels with the National Corn Growers Association. Of course, we can't do this work without our membership and our sponsors. Uh, this week's sponsors are First Farmers Bank and Trust, as well as Bain Welker, a uh, Case IH dealer here in Indiana. Uh, thank you to First Farmers Bank and Trust and Bain Welker for their sponsorship this week. And again, we can't do the, the work that we do. We can't do the advocacy work that we do without our corporate uh, partners, as well as the membership. And we'll be hearing from Mike Beard uh, president of ICGA. Uh, later on in the program, just talk about the benefits of membership and why you should join. So next, uh, I'm going to turn the program over to Elena Jetty. She's our biofuels director here in Indiana, and she's going to have a conversation uh, with Nathaniel Doddridge, who's the vice president of fuels. So Elena, come on, let's get you, get you up on the screen and you take over and tell us about the work that you're doing uh, here in Indiana. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Good morning, everyone. As the Biofuels Director for Indiana Corn Marketing Council and Indiana Soybean Alliance, a major part of my role and program area is to continuously build new and maintain existing relationships with those in the fuel retail industry to expand market outreach and infrastructure of ethanol and biodiesel. Before we begin, I would like to ask the audience to be thinking of questions because afterwards, the first five questions typed into the chat will be eligible for a $25 gift card compliments of Casey's. Okay, let's get this show on the road. I met our next presenter in the summer of 2018 in collaboration to onboard the very first four Casey's E15 location stations to Indiana. At the time we met, Nathaniel, along with his amazing fuel team, and I did not know Unleaded 88 E15, which is a common brand name you will see out in the market and in this presentation, would grow to the now over 35 locations throughout the state of Indiana. Nathaniel has over 15 years in the fuel retail industry and currently serves as the Vice President of Fuels at Casey's. I am pleased to welcome my friend and his amazing accent all the way from Acne, Iowa, Nathaniel Doddridge. Nathaniel? Thank you for being with us today, and I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I've been in, in Iowa now for three years, and um, I, I talked to one of our store managers last week, and she said, um, after I got done talking to her, she was in Nebraska, she said, where are you from? I said, well, I can promise you I'm not from the greater Des Moines area, but yeah, thanks for having me. And, you know, my goal today is really to, to maybe just give you an update on where we're at, not only from, um, from a fuel industry, but also Casey's. Um, we've, we've made the headlines a lot um, over the last, uh, really last few weeks, but also the last couple of years as we continue to transform um, who Casey's is. And so, you know, as we start off, I thought it would be really good for us to to really take a step back and think about um, really the industry in general as we think about fuel. You know, one of the challenges we face and a lot of the feedback we get from um, our partners across the industry, our guests, is 
uh, why don't we move very fast on certain things? And uh, the first reason I would say that is because we're, we're really big as a corporation, uh, but also our business is extremely complex. And, you know, this is a slide I actually showed to our board not too long ago. And uh, you think about the, the progress of, of this industry over the really the last 15 to 16 years as I've been in it, it's, it's transformed drastically. You think about when Casey started in the, in the early, uh, in the 1950s, we, it was really a very clean vertical of the business and it was the oil industry and you had, um, you know, you started to add the sea store space. And so as we've expanded the industry over the last 50 years, um, you've added different pieces of the business. And most importantly for today, you act, you actually, you added that top portion of this chart that you're looking at that shows the, the really, the renewable industry. If you think about where Casey's is placed, um, it's, it, it really is a perfect fit for us as we think about the things that we're going to talk about today. So uh, again, as you think about what we talk about, and as you think about those questions you're going to ask to get that $25 gift card to get fuel or pizza or whatever you want from a Casey's. Just remember that, again, this is hard. The business is changing, it's evolving. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I feel like we're positioned as better, uh, better than uh, we've ever been to, to, be, to be forward thinking. Um, so when you think about our footprint, um, the Casey's footprint, uh, this surprises a lot of folks. So um, as we move to the next slide, our footprint, uh, even though we started in the heart of the Midwest, um, I was actually a little surprised at this. Yesterday, I saw that our store count, we're actually over 2,200 locations today. So uh, almost 2,200, uh, almost 2,300 locations, actually. So, uh, but if you think about those locations, they're still really peppered in the heart of, of rural America. And so 60%, um, slightly a little bit less than 60% are, are in towns of 5,000 or less. And you think about where we're putting stores. Yeah, we're putting stores in the greater Des Moines area, but we're also putting stores in small towns across the U.S. where folks continue to pull out of. And so we continue to feel like that's a core footprint for Casey's. Um, yeah, as I talked about, we've transformed a lot on the fuel side. But, you know, one thing that's interesting, and I put the slide, uh, pictures in here at the bottom right is, um, you know, one thing we're doing is we're actually rolling out our own proprietary brands. And so as we think about Casey, Casey's Great Pizza, Great Donuts, you know, what are some of the package things that we can bring to the market that, that folks want to buy? Um, you know, as, as the headline says, we, we've grown our full, uh, fuel footprint. Um, you know, we're, we're actually over, over 300 locations now nationwide uh, for E15. You know, we're at over 1,000 locations for biodiesel. And so, um, you know, we're really in this balance of what fuel we sell, but also what's going on behind the scenes at the store behind, uh, behind the fuel pumps. And so not only do we want to invest in the forecourt um, or the fuel dispensers, but we also want to invest in the backcourt and continue to make that guest experience at Casey's um, uh, best in class. And so one headline that uh, I kind of alluded to a few minutes ago is, um, you know, we've historically bought, you know, onesie, twosie locations at Casey's, but we actually are in the process of growing our, our footprint uh, with a Bucky's acquisition. Some of you in Indiana might not be familiar with who Bucky's is. So what I thought I would do is just take a, a just a brief minute just to update, uh, update you on this. And I wouldn't really get too wrapped around the axle on, you know, the acquisition, but I think it probably shows you that we're going to continue to invest in the Casey's brand. And so this is the largest acquisition in Casey's history. And so um, hopefully by the end of the month, we'll be closing on a deal to acquire uh, 94 convenience stores, um, which is great. And um, those are placed around Chicago. Those are in Omaha, a little bit in, in uh, Western Missouri. Uh, but what's even a little bit more surprising is actually we're, we're picking up a dealer network. And for those not familiar with the industry, that's actually where Casey's becomes a fuel supplier for um, 
for individual uh, operators of convenience stores. And so there's about um, 150,000 uh, individual operators across the US. And so this actually gives us the capability to go out and take some of the Casey's processes, um, take some of the Casey's influence to go out and bring those things to other, other retailers who might not have the capability to go do that. Um, again, we're an $8 billion enterprise that, um, continues to invest in Casey's, but this will give us a network to go out and to deliver fuel and potentially look at how do we how do we help those businesses um, be more sustainable? How, how do we help them more profitable in the markets that they're in? And so, again, don't get too wrapped around the axle on the who or the what, but I do think that this is really kind of shines a light on a pretty significant um, change for Casey's. And as we think about us being the fourth largest retailer in the country, um, we're really well on our, our way to really start to try to nibble at those guys in that third, uh, second and third spot. So, um, so maybe let's shift now to a little bit of our uh, kind of what most of you probably tuned in for is really how about Casey's and biofuel. So although the company was founded in 1959, um, and although we did get into um, ethanol blending in the early 2000s when um, you had some very lucrative tax credits, um, specifically around the federal tax credit with, with E10. You know, we did some things internally um, prior to me that was taking advantage of, of, of selling ethanol. Um, but there was really this gap between 2004 and 2017 um, when I got here where we didn't do a whole lot. You had a lot of the um, of the renewable folks, a lot of the ethanol industry, the bio industry, really come into Casey's and saying, "Hey, great, you got us to E10 in all of your locations, but you know what about E15? What about E85? What about biodiesel?" And so, um, as I joined in August of 2017, we really started listening to those conversations, like we've had with Indiana, like we've had um, with Missouri, like we've had with Nebraska, Iowa, and said, okay there's something here, right? There's some value here, uh, not only from just the base financials of the product we sell, but also a, co a consumer here that we can, that we can appease because look at our footprint. We are surrounded in a lot of our locations by soybeans, uh, by corn. And so it makes natural sense for us to really blend those two things together and say, hey, why can't we be on the forefront of having higher blend? And so we started that journey really in 2017. Um, and as I just mentioned, in 2018, we, we hit not, uh, 900 biodiesel stores. Um, and today we're over 1,000 biodiesel stores. And my data is a little old, I apologize. Um, but uh, we're now um, right at 300 locations where we sell E15 and E85. And so um, that's great. Um, but as we switch to the next slide, I think it's important to know how are we, how are we selling it? Because um, as I talked about very first on this um, you know, presentation is it's complex. And the one thing I'll say is the guest for Casey's, um, anytime, anytime things are a little too complex, you start to really lose that guest attention. And so what we've tried to do is we've really tried to take a couple different approaches here. So the one thing we didn't talk about is we actually changed the name of, of E15 to Unleaded 88 um, about 18 months ago. And the reason we did that was really to gain alignment within our industry. We, we, we were really approaching this, this challenge of you called E15 so many different things. And so how do we gain alignment? is we create uniformity. And so, um, but further, what we've done is we've actually tried to sell Unleaded 88 a couple different ways. And so as you see on your screen, left to right, um, is really how we do it at most locations. And so given some of the standards at the federal and local level, you, you have challenges with um, a single hose. Uh, so selling it out of separate hose tends to be how we tend to sell um, E15. Um, and so as I talked about, the guest adoption to that can be a little mixed because as I show up every day to pick up that red nozzle, put it in my car, it becomes somewhat of natural for me. As I show up again, and now there's three nozzles to choose from, I tend to really not pay attention to what's on the left or what's new. I focus to what I'm used to grabbing. Um, fueling your car 
is a scary experience for a lot of people and specifically around picking up the wrong nozzle and putting it in a tank. A, a funny story really quickly, I was on vacation last week, went down to Branson to spend a couple of days with my wife and three kids and I was fueling at a store in Branson. I see a guest pick up a diesel nozzle and stick it in her car. It scared me to death. I immediately went to that guest and said, hey, 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 do you realize you just put that diesel nozzle um, in your Chevy Cruze? She's, and it was a, it was a younger, uh, younger lady. And she said, hey, I got this. This is a diesel Cruze. And so, again, I'm sensitive to that. I know our guests are sensitive to that. So that's kind of how we sell um, in most instances that, that um, e, uh, unleaded 88. What we've tried to do is start to really try to um, layer into the market. What is the adoption of unleaded 88 when it comes out of a single hose, which is what you see in the middle. And so what you see in the middle is really us selling that out of a single hose. And we're able to do that in certain markets to where if you still sell it, um, out of a separate hose on one dispenser, then you can sell it out of the same hose um, at other dispensers. And so you can see that in the middle. And across the bottom there, average sales, above average sales. And then when you go to the very end, as I, as I call out best in class, we've actually taken E10 out of the, the store and only sell in that picture an 87 without ethanol and an unleaded 88. And that's where you, of course, you see the best in class sales ratio compared to our peers is because that looks very much like what you put in your car on a day-to-day -day basis. And so those are the three different ways that we sell um, unleaded 88. And so um, as we shift to the next slide, I think it's important to think about what do we think is true about the current environment, about the future environment as we think about fuel. Specific to unleaded 88, anything blended with ethanol, um, anything fuel related, really, we know price is the influencer. So how can we continue to make sure that price is king? When we sell unleaded 88, <clears throat> on most times, it's five cents cheaper than 87, 10. Hey, that's a win. The second thing we know is guests have a long memory. And this tends to be a little bit more on biodiesel than it does on ethanol. But if, if I ever had a bad experience with fuel, Whatever that fuel was or whoever that retailer was, I never forget it as a guest. I steer clear of those things. And so you have to be very careful as you put things in the market um, to do it right the first time. Um, the other thing I'll say is guests, they don't know anything about the fuel they're putting in their car. I would say that 98% of the people in this company of 36,000 employees have no clue about the molecule behind, uh, that goes into their cars. And so the guests are the same way. Um, I will say that we do feel that ethanol long term is the blend stock of choice. It will continue to add value. We feel like you saw it through COVID. You know, ethanol prices increase, RENs offset. There's still that balance of ethanol and RENs that we're going through right now. So having that full line of sight on your supply economics will continue to be really, really important for us. And I will tell you a little bit of why we might have not done it historically because we didn't, even internally, we didn't understand those supply economics. And then the last thing I'll say is um, the future of, uh, of fuel is, is muddier than ever. And I would say liquid fuel. And I think in the last three years, we've talked about things from 95 Ron, 98 Ron, uh, more, more diesel in the markets. Um, then you have the introduction of, of more EVs. Um, uh, the, the future of fuel will continue to be a little muddy. And so I think those are things we know are true as we think about how we set cases up for success. The last thing I'll say before, uh, the last two slides I'll cover before we shift into Q&A, because I think hopefully everyone has some, some Q&A for us is um, a little on COVID. So this next slide, uh, it's really, really busy. But the one thing I will just kind of summarize it with is, Red and yellow aren't great for our industry in regards to demand. You know, we're experience, experiencing the second peak in COVID. If you think back to the, the worst of COVID, you know, our demand was down somewhere around 40%. That's public knowledge. Um, most retailers saw something like that, if not worse. Um, if you look at this chart, this is a great chart from, um, from Opus and some other mobility data that we pulled. Again, summarizing, it's that really that 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 social and recreation travel that that really that that we've missed out on since March. 
you know, people are traveling less. I think back to last week, our volume over Thanksgiving was not great, but it was because um, people just aren't traveling as much. Shopping and errands takes up a lot of demand historically. That's been somewhat okay as, as things have opened back up. We all know that people are making changes when regards to the work environment. And so I will say at Casey's, um, we're still only about 30% of capacity at the store uh, store support center. Um, and then those other things that have influence on, on, on demand, those are things that are continuing to be under pressure. And so we're continuing to watch this, especially as we get in the winter and knowing that demand historically in winter is the worst part of the year. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're a little bit um, wide eyed to just kind of see how things turn out. And so um, the last slide I'll talk about before we move it into Q&A um, is probably a little bit specific to this group. Um, and, and I'll just kind of draw your attention to really the peak in the valley. And so um, I would call your attention to the red on this chart. And that's really driving traffic and driving trends that we've seen in Iowa and Indiana. Um, I thought Indiana would be good for this conversation uh, just because it, it, it's close to home um, for you guys. And you can see we saw um, off of January and February volume. So this goes back and looks at volume from January to February, then benchmarks the, the future volume off of that. Um, you saw during the summer this gradual increase in, in, in mobility, therefore demand. Um, but you're starting to see that curve start to really trend off. And a lot of what we're seeing with that driving traffic, uh, you know, if you think back to the last slide, it was that it was that outdoor recreational traffic. And so, yeah, maybe you weren't um, doing your net, your daily trip out for lunch with your, with your, with your friends for lunch, but maybe when you got home from work, you and your family jumped in the car just to get out of the house. Uh, I know we did that a lot during, during the peak of COVID. And so now in the winter, you really start to, it, it goes into huddle down mode. Again, being from the South, I promise you, I don't like to be out a whole lot in the winter. And so now with COVID, that's even more, um, uh, tight in regards to demand. And so I think that's just something for, for everyone on this, you know, uh, this meeting to kind of think about is, um, we still have a lot of headwinds for demand. Uh, we still have no clear visibility into when things are going to kind of come out of this, but also what does it go back to? I, I really think that there's probably a certain amount of demand that we'll never get back. I don't know what that number is, but um, just something to consider as you think about your planning for the future is uh, demand that we saw leading into COVID will look a lot different coming out of COVID. And that's probably a sustainable um, position for demand uh, long-term. So with that, uh, hopefully we have some good Q&A and we'll see who wants some, some Casey's Pizza or some Unleaded 88. Wow, thank you, Nathaniel, for that excellent presentation. You know, that chart just really speaks volumes, literally, um, to just, you know, where, where we're at with, with what's happening and how the domino effects of COVID, it's very impactful, clearly, to every niche of, of every industry. And I think Casey's, is, you guys have really weathered this storm and continue to move forward and uh, continue to get stations open and expand. Obviously, your new food food product and beverage product. I've been following on your your Casey's app as a loyalty member. Um, I'm excited to try yet again some other offerings that you have along with your pizza. Um, you know, I know we've got a couple questions here coming here. I'm going to get to Rachel in a second, but you know, as we work together, and you know, congratulations on recently becoming an award recipient of the USDA Higher Blends Infrastructure Incentive Program. Um, for those of you that don't know on this uh, uh, call here, uh, yeah, Casey's put in uh, to, to get a 50% match and, and was successful with that. And they're going to be expanding more biofuels offerings across, across the United States. Um, I guess so, Nathaniel, with programs like that, working with Indiana Corn Marketing Council, um, how do you see this collaboration and partnership, you know, benefits with Casey's and, and moving forward? Yeah, good question, and, and thanks for the the call out on on the USDA. You know, we had the we had the the luxury of having Sonny Purdue and, and Chuck Grassley um, at, at one of our newest locations in Ankeny uh, a few uh, about a month and a month and a half ago, and so it's good to see them on site to really show them and really talk them through the work that has to go in to use that money. Um, so. 
I think about specifically that that grant, um, and I've said this a lot over the last really 60 days as I talk to folks about why we did it, or maybe some of the challenges with it, um, is why we did it obviously is to grow higher blends and to help us really manage through the capital challenges we have as an $8 billion business. Just because you're an $8 billion business doesn't mean money just flows from every corner of, of, of the office, right? So I have to go to fight for every dollar I can get. Um, but as we go and, and go after these things, as we partnered with, with guys like yourself, is first of all, that funding is super beneficial, right? We wouldn't be where we were at without support from a funding perspective. The second is really about that message alignment and getting awareness out there. As I described, it's a complex business. Um, it's a challenge. You know, I think a lot of the influence from organizations like this to really clean up our message um, has been really important. And so um, you think about us, our move from E15 to Unleaded 88, it really came from you know um, settings like this where there was some confusion in the industry, and so I think that's where I've really tried to lean on folks like yourself to say, "Hey, what's everybody else doing?" Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it's hard for me to pick up the phone and call Speedway or pick up the phone and call whoever Pump and Pantry in Nebraska, um, but in these settings, right, they come together. It's like, "Hey, this is what I saw in the market." This is the success they're having. And then that helps us kind of get over that edge and really from a financial, but also from a marketing and actually get things actually going in the market. I, I think about some of our conversations we had probably a year ago as we really transitioned a lot of stores in Indiana was really how do we navigate through the state requirements for um, for the nozzle, for the hose, for how we can sell it, how can we message it? And I think, again, influence from groups like this really help us and keep us out of the ditch. Well, and thank you, Nathaniel, for, I remember when we, when we onboarded those first stores in 2018, we we quickly transitioned that E15 to Unleaded 88 when, when we started seeing the landscape of, of what was really resonating with the consumer. So I appreciate, you know, we don't know the future. We don't know everything that consumers are going to buy. We, we put it out there, test it, and then make transitions, you know, as needed. Um, let me get to Rachel, um, our, our guru behind the webinar. Rachel, do you have a question in the chat that you would like to ask Nathaniel from our guests? I do. So we've got our first submitted question from Meggie. It is with 300 E15 and E85 sites across the country, what is the average sales volume per site for ethanol blends specifically, not including E10? Yeah, so I will say that that varies. Um, you know, I described the three different types of, um, three different types of ways we sell it. And so um, you can, I would say most instances you see, you know, that sales mix for higher blends um, around the low teens, which, and some people kind of look at that and they might scoff at that and say 10%, 11%, whatever that number is. Gosh, that's not much, but you think about really where the market is. Most stations, not just cases, but you know anybody else is probably selling somewhere around 90 to 92 percent of their their fuel is e 87 e10. And so, anytime you can introduce a fuel and get that type of buy-in, I think it goes back to that value, right? Guests will make crazy decisions um, to save a penny. Um, we see it every day in, in our in our footprint. And so, um, if you think about the highest end of you know half you know some of those stores of course when you're picking up that nozzle and that's all that comes out it's a pretty high percentage of, of fuel moving through that location that are um that are uh uh higher blends of methanol the one thing i'll say that's probably most important is less about the percent today we are continuing to see um, folks continue to, to to buy higher blends and so it's not this acceleration and then deceleration uh, we are seeing that product hold its own, uh, hold its own year over year. And so I think that's probably the most encouraging piece as we think about percent of sales is we're seeing it grow. Uh, and that means that it's working for customers. Um, it's not blowing their car up as some might tell you it will. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that's how I would probably answer that is um, we're, we're growing and it continues to be a good portion of our, that's why we don't, this isn't, I, 
I've said this before, this isn't the field of dreams. Um, it's not if you build it, they will come. Um, we put the product out there because our guests want it. Thank you for that, Daniel. I know we, we just got our, our Q&A just filled up rapid. So I don't know, Rachel, there's a couple rapid fire questions we could uh, target for, for Nathaniel that you see. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a question from Scott. As Ivy Tech Community College is moving many courses, including agriculture into virtual learning as a response to COVID, are there resources that Casey has which we could access to supplement our instruction in ag, econ, crop production, and career prep related classes? I will note that there's a relatively new Casey's located about 20 minutes from our campus. Oh, that's a good one, Nathaniel. I'm going to come back to that one. I'm not sure I can answer that in, in the appropriate time. So if you can send me that question mm -hmm. and uh, his his contact, and we'll, we'll circle back on that. I will send you that question, but we will go ahead and award. Great Scott question. A, uh, a gift card. Don't worry, Scott, you will get one. Uh, I've got a question from Leslie. Uh, the different types of pumps and sales options were very interesting. Are these based off of regional trends? Uh, are there upgrade opportunities as locations are remodeled? Yeah, so I will tell you every new store we build um, gets that far. So the, 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 the picture that's on the screen right now, every new store we build, whether it's in Iowa, Indiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, wherever, Michigan, um, the pumps will look like that. So we will sell higher blends at every new store we open, um, which is great, right? It's a great win. Um, every raise and rebuild, um, will get higher blends. One thing that's actually helping us get more higher blends into the market is we, we're trying to solve for, um, I won't bore you the details, but there's a there's a, a fraud shift that's happening within our industry where Visa and MasterCard shifts credit card fraud to Casey's and other retailers next year. And so as we go through that, we actually need to do some enhancements around hardware, around dispensers. And so that's a way that we're also taking um, taking this approach to try to change up that capacity. The, the challenge tends to be though, as you know, it's less about what's above the ground, but more what's below the ground. And so still working through a lot of things with tanks and piping. I know ACE did some great things around developing some resources for us to really check um, what's compatible and what's not. But we are testing those scenarios all across the U.S. Um, and across our 16 states to try to figure out is it a you know is it a test and learn environment that creates different types of responses whether again whether you're in Iowa Nebraska or wherever you're at so we're trying those different types of things depending on the market we're in yeah Nathaniel no I, these are great and, I, and all the questions I know we, we don't get to everybody which We'll have to do a transition now um, for the next guest, but you really set up the next presentation nicely, Nathaniel, because you're absolutely right. State by state has different some you know fuel codes and regulations, and you have to navigate that with every state. I do not envy your position on that. Um, you know, so when we do see different types of hoses and nozzles and and how you can dispense them, it can be a little tricky, and it is you know, at the end of the day, I'd love to just see unleaded 88 like you have in a lot of locations that's just the new regular. Um, well, Nathaniel, I just want to say thank you for taking the time today. I know you're, you're very busy with your over 2,200 locations now and growing. Um, good luck with the, the new merger and acquisition with Bucky's. I know that's going to be very successful. And I just want to say thank you so much. And I look forward to hosting and having you again in the future. Yeah, thank you for having me and looking forward to it. Hey guys, I just want to note really quick for our audience that Cresswell Heiser and Tom Beckman were our other two question askers. So you guys will get gift cards and I will send your questions directly to Nathaniel and get you a written answer back. But I really appreciate the robust, actually Nathaniel, I'm going to have probably a dozen questions to send hey, you send them my way. Yep. afterwards. So we really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, uh, Nathaniel and Elena. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Elena and Nathaniel, thanks again for that very insightful discussion about the the, the work that we're doing on uh, here in Indiana. And, uh, you know, the the presence of Casey's here in Indiana has certainly been uh, been good to see the expansion of biofuels options um, in Indiana. So, uh, thanks again for your your presentation, your time with us today. I just want to talk a little more about what's going on here in Indiana with regards to uh, biofuels. There is going to be uh, some legislation this year uh, as it relates to, to gasohol. Uh, there was a couple of years ago I first heard of this concern and, and frankly I hadn't heard the term gasohol for 
for quite quite a few years because we refer to, refer to uh, to ethanol as ethanol blended blended fuel. We haven't, I mean, I haven't really heard much about gas all since President Ford was stumbling down the stairs of Air Force One. Um, it's, so it's been quite a while. I mean, probably since Pat Benatar was telling us to hit her with her best shot. So, uh, so it's been several years since I've heard the term gas haul. However, it is still on the, on the books here in Indiana, that, that, uh, that term, and that's needed to be, um, be updated because EPA is allowed, uh, for year round sales starting, uh, in May of, uh, 2019. And we need to update that code to provide some certainty, uh, for blenders and retailers. And, uh, we, we are working on, um, on legislation uh, to, to get that done, so we can again provide that uh, that certainty for the for the blend for the blenders and the the retailers, so they can allow for an additional uh, E15 blends here in Indiana. Uh, just working the, the coalition to get this done. Country Mark is kind of leading that effort. Uh, Indiana Ethanol Producers Association is involved. The Corn Growers Association is involved, involved as well as Indiana Farm Bureau uh, and some others. So it's really a broad coalition of, of agriculture and uh, ethanol interest and also refining interest uh, to get this, uh, get this language upgraded or updated. So uh, we paved the way for more E15 sales here in Indiana. Uh, just uh, so you know, uh, in case you hear from us uh, through session that we need to uh, need some action from our members, uh, it is going to be authored by uh, Senator Mark Mesmer of, uh, of Dubois County. He's the uh, actually he's the chairman of the Senate Environmental Affairs Committee, and he's going to be carrying this legislation. And uh, the General Assembly starts uh, uh, January fourth. I do want to mention just uh, again that. Uh, this this year's session is going to be a little more of a challenge than than other years, just simply because of the COVID uh, restrictions that are going to be in place to keep uh, uh, keep the session as safe as possible. Uh, so the the House session is going to be held uh, outside of the, uh, the the Capitol building itself. It's going to be at the Government Center South, and the Senate's going to operate uh, their business uh, there in the. Uh, in the state house, so it's the the flow of the of the session is going to be a little different, and of course it's a long session. It's the budget year, uh, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, surrounding the budget, and we're going to certainly watch that as well as other agricultural issues. Uh, but just know that it's going to be a little different uh, this year, given um, the safeguards that the uh, the leadership at the state house has put in place uh, because of the COVID concern. Uh, and, and mentioning the, the General Assembly, I just want to do a, a shout out to Representative Don Leahy, uh, Chair of the House Ag Committee. Uh, he is on, uh, on the webinar with us today, as well as I believe uh, uh, Senator Stoops has joined us also. So thank, thank to, thanks to the two of them for taking time to be with us today. So next up, uh, we heard uh, what we were doing here uh, within Indiana uh, to advance biofuels. And uh, we're going to bring on uh, National Corn Growers Association uh, to talk about the Next Generations Next Generation Fuels Act. This has been an effort that uh, uh, corn, National Corn Growers has worked on for a number of years, along alongside of some other stakeholders, to build out this uh, this legislative effort. And with us today is Kathy Bergren. She's the director of biofuels at, uh, for NCGA. Uh, Kathy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's good to see you, and I'm sure uh, things in Washington are rather hectic, and we really appreciate your work that you do uh, for ethanol, uh, but also pass on our thanks to the rest of the staff. I know there's a full staff in, in Washington, and that's one of the things that, one of the benefits uh, that you get with your uh, Indiana membership. Both, both corn and soy have, have uh, national organizations that work on our behalf uh, day in and day out right there on Capitol Hill. And we appreciate your work. And um, again, we'll be hearing from Mike Beard later about the benefits of membership, but I just want you to know that as an Indiana member, you're also an, an NCGA member. So, uh, Kathy, what do you have to tell us about the New Generations Fuels Act or any other uh, ethanol related issues that may have popped up in the past few days? Well, no, thanks. Thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate uh, joining joining you all in Indiana today. Um, you know, certainly, 
you know, I think kind of building off of, of what we heard from, from the last presentation, you know, we heard Nathaniel and, and Elena talking about, you know, kind of how the, how the fuels market continues to change. And, and certainly there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, a, a lot of competition. Um, and, you know, I think we really look at for, you know, for, for ethanol, for, for biofuels, we feel like we've really had a lot of success from the renewable fuel standard as, as a federal policy. It's been, it's been very successful, um, you know, for, especially for you all, both on the, the ethanol and, and biodiesel um, side, side of the coin. And I think we really look at, you know, how do we, you know, take where, where we are with the, with the renewable fuel standard and, and look forward and, and, and just, and, you know, and, you know, build on that success um, to continue to keep renewable fuels, um, competitive and and to have an, an important role in in the marketplace going forward. So I think you know for for the National Corn Growers Association, um, we've been working very closely with with our, with all of the state associations in, including Indiana corn um, on you know on, on different a lot of different avenues you know to really make sure that you know we're looking forward and and, and thinking about how how we stay competitive in in the long term. And, and, and one of those, you know, I think one of those important pieces of, of the solution on, on the ethanol side is, is some legislation that, that we've been working on and, and that was introduced uh, this fall by, by Congresswoman Bustos. She is from, from Illinois, um, but we've, you know, been working with her, her and her staff and, and, and also with, with ethanol producers um, on this legislation, it's really built on work from a really broad range of stakeholders on the on the technical side as well, certainly including automakers and 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 others. So there's a lot of really good um, technical work that that's gone into this legislation to again really look at you know what how do we build on the success of of the RFS to really continue to. Um, be, be competitive and, and support um, ethanol demand in the future. Um, this is a very forward looking bill. This is not, you know, not, not something that's going to, uh, you know, it's really talking about a transition in, in the gasoline supply. So that's, that's not something that's going to be immediate. But I think, you know, if, if we don't start taking these steps now, we, we don't really ever get to that point. So Really, what this legislation does is is really kind of emphasize a few different things um, in you know in this space. Um, really, we're transitioning um, the gasoline supply to gasoline with with a higher octane content. Um, you know, I think as you know, saw some of the pictures on on the pumps there um, that that were part of Nathaniel's presentation. Um, you know, as we know that, that you saw the eighty seven and, and the eighty eight. We, you know, across the country typically measure, um, you know, octane uh, on those terms. It's AKI, anti-knock index. Um, and this will really change the way that, that we're measuring octane and really and increase the octane requirement um, for, for, for gasoline. It would be measured on a different scale. Um, it's called RON, research octane number. And, and what higher octane fuel allows automakers to do is, is design more efficient engines that, that um, get more miles per gallon, um, that reduce emissions. And you know, they know they have the technology to make these more efficient, efficient engines right now, but you don't get those efficiency benefits when you are when you're running those engines on um, you know kind of a standard a standard regular gasoline right now that's at a lower octane level, so I think the idea behind uh, you know transitioning the gasoline supply to to higher octane is really the the the, ben the really broad range of benefits that that you get from this um, again improving fuel efficiency, reducing emissions and really for, for us, you know, ethanol is, is really the most cost effective source of, of additional octane. Ethanol by itself has a very high octane rating and, and other properties that, that really work well with these more advanced engines. Ethanol also has the benefit of, of, of being the lowest cost. So we're really providing the greatest benefit um, by blending more ethanol at the least cost to drivers, and at the same time, really replacing some of the most harmful petroleum-based components in, in gasoline. 
Um, so what does this mean for farmers? Um, you know, over time, and again, this is a long-term transition for the gasoline supply. Uh, you know, I think if we look at look at history, you know, people will remember um, the transition from to unleaded gasoline. So it'd be a similar type of transition. So we know it takes a while, but I think when 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 fully implemented, uh, would would really increase ethanol demand and therefore corn demand over, over the long term. So I think that's why this really remains an important you know, priority for, for NCGA and uh, working with state corn grower associations. Um, I think if we sort of look at the current kind of context, there's certainly a lot of, of interest around you know, reducing emissions. Um, the transportation sector is, is, is a significant source of both um, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as other, other pollutants. And so you think we have really kind of have an opportunity to look at you know, how high octane fuels can really be part of this overall solution um, that, that is you know, a lot of interest on the federal policy level of, of reducing emissions. Um, when, you know, when you have more efficient engines that are paired with you know, matched with the right kind of fuel, those, you know, those engines are much more fuel efficient. So you're, you're reducing fuel usage, reducing emissions that way. And by um, requiring that that additional octane come from low carbon sources, such as ethanol, we're also doing more to, um, to reduce carbon emissions um, through, you know, through this proposal. So, you know, I think really we look at, you know, this, this legislation doesn't require a, a specific level of ethanol blending, but really removes the barriers to mid-level ethanol blends up to a 30% blend, and then also puts some guardrails in place, such as requiring octane to come from low carbon sources, um, to put a new cap on um, portions of gasoline that are referred to as aromatics. These are, these are some of the most um, toxic components of gasoline and ethanol also replaces those. And so that really helps us continue the progress that has been made um, when we're blending 10% ethanol and, and really opens the door to, to higher blends in, in the future to really continue to improve gasoline so that, so that gasoline remains competitive in, in the long term. Um, you know, I think we'll see a lot of discussion um, in, in Congress around um, reducing, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, there, this is certainly a, a, a priority um, across, across, you know, across Congress and, and in the administration. I think the good news for ethanol is, is ethanol is a low carbon fuel and you can kind of see on on, on this chart, the progress that, that ethanol is making reducing its carbon footprint, while at the same time, we see the carbon footprint of gasoline, unblended gasoline is, is, is going up. I think that really speaks to um, the attributes of, of ethanol that you know, this legislation um, really, really capitalizes on. You know, we have lower carbon, higher octane, and lower cost for both of those really uh, create create an advantage um, for for ethanol going forward um, that, that that we need to take you know really take advantage of in, in in this so I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the legislation um, you know I think we certainly uh, want you know it's really important for um, you know folks like you members of, of Indiana corn growers to feel comfortable with with this legislation. Um, that said, you know, I don't think everybody, you know, we don't all need to, you know, the, the details are important, but really the big picture, I, I think, on this legislation is, is really helpful when, when it comes to, you know, talking to members of Congress and, and their staff. And, and I think because this legislation does a lot of different things and, and takes advantage of, you know, of, of the different characteristics, we can really talk about this legislation um, with different members of Congress and their staff and really hit on the things that are most important to them. If, you know, if, if there's, you know, members who really are really prioritizing and we need to reduce emissions, we, we, we've got that covered here. If we have, you know, folks who are concerned about, well, I want to make sure that, you know, fuels and vehicles um, keep remain affordable. 
and, and that consumers really have continue to have a choice. Um, this really helps, you know, drivers have a choice in, in the future of, of the you know, fuels and vehicles that are affordable and, and meet their needs. You know, and, and for, you know, and I think for members of Congress who really want to, you know, care about, you know, what's, what's going to help drive demand in agriculture and in, in rural economies, we, we also, you know, this, this also, um, you know, play, you know, factors into that as well. I mean, that's, you know, that's really where we come into that on, on the corn grower side is, is really the impact that this is going to have, um, you know, going forward in, in terms of increasing demand. So what have we been doing since this legislation's been, been introduced? Um, we've certainly been working on, you know, outreach to members of Congress and, and their staff and, you know, kind of really helping educate them on this. This is a new, a new issue for a lot of them, just like it is for, for a lot of us. Um, certainly appreciate, you know, I know that you, you all in Indiana have been, um, you know, reaching out to some of your members of Congress and, and really encourage you to continue to do that. Um, like I said, really sort of, you know, getting, getting the, you know, engaging the grassroots on this. I would point out that there are a lot of resources on this legislation um, that are uh, on NCGA's website, ncga.com slash octane. These resources are, are really aimed at, you know, at, at our members and helping you kind of understand the background of this and, and the big picture on this bill. There's some good videos, um, other fact sheets. So I would really, really encourage you to, to use, those, use those resources to help learn more about this issue. And then we've also really been working um, to um, get feedback from other stakeholders um, that we feel as in, that, that are important to, to this process, such as um, those in the environmental communities, automakers, and, and others in agriculture. And as we go forward, um, you know, as we know, when you, when you get to the end of a congressional session like we are right now, all legislation uh, comes to an end and, and something has to be reintroduced in January. So we're really working um, with, with, our, with our bill sponsor and hopefully other members of Congress who, who want to co-sponsor this legislation um, to kind of consider um, any input from, from stakeholders as, you know, as we look at reintroducing this legislation. Um, again, asking, asking members of Congress, particularly those in, in, in corn states to, to co-sponsor this legislation. We'll be looking at, um, you know, at, at, at a companion legislation in, in the Senate. I think we feel like it's very important that this be bipartisan legislation. Um, you know, most of the things that, that we do in agriculture really do work best when they're bipartisan, whether it's regard to biofuels, trade, crop insurance, farm bill, all of those things really require bi bipartisan support. And you know, this is probably not a piece of legislation that is gonna move by itself. Um, it, that seems pretty unlikely. So I think we're really trying to position this legislation you know, as, as really part of the solution for, for reducing uh, emissions from the transportation sector. A really good piece of that solution that, that really helps keep um, biofuels and liquid fuels modernized and, and relevant for the long run. You know, I think we, we, hear, we hear a lot about electric vehicles, you know, we hear a lot about other alternative um, technologies and fuels. I think we want to make sure that, you know, that, that biofuels are, are part of that solution and, and, are, going, and are able to compete, um, you know, in, on a level playing field and, and, and a higher octane standard for gasoline kind of coupled with low carbon requirements really takes advantage of, of the best things that ethanol has to offer and, and really helps keep those fuels and, and vehicles competitive um, over, over the long term. So that, that's really, I think that's really an important part of, a part of what, we're, what we're doing. Um, I guess I will you know, talk a little bit about you know, some of the specifics of, of the legislation. Um, Again, we're, you know, we're really going to um, increase the, um, the, the octane requirement for, for gasoline to a minimum of, of 98 RON. What does that mean if you look at the pump today? Um, that's the equivalent. Today's regular um, 87 is, is the same as a, as a 91 RON. So this would be a, a, pretty, a pretty good bump in, in octane. But this again, this is what this is what allows automakers to use the knowledge and technologies they have 
to make these, you know, optimized, more efficient engines that that are going to that are going to run on on a, that need a higher octane fuel to to operate. Um, really feel like this level of octane really opens the door um, to mid-level ethanol blends such as E25 and and E30 are really the most efficient and cost-effective way to um, to get to that higher octane level. Again, requirement that these um, you know sources of octane have fewer greenhouse gas emissions than than gasoline. It's really kind of as guardrails here to um, you know to to help direct that this additional octane comes comes from ethanol. Not a mandate, not a requirement, but but really setting you know really setting the the, the standards um, to to steer that direction and really prevent backsliding. Um, you know, away from the, the progress that we've already made on, on blending more renewable fuels. A couple of other parts of the legislation, and, and we don't have to, you know, go into these, but we really remove a lot of the, there's a lot of barriers to higher mid-level blends of ethanol that, that kind of need to be moved out of the way. And we, we know we've talked a lot about the, um, the, the barriers on, on RVP that, that allow you know, year-round sales of E15 really kind of build on that and, and, and move up to you know, where you know, an approval for a blends up to E30, give all of those blends the, the same type of treatment as, as we're giving E15 right now um, so, so that there's room in, in more space in, in the tank for, for our products. And then finally, we really look at on um, the vehicle and, and, and infrastructure side. So it does require automakers um, for future model years to design and warrant all vehicles um, for use on higher octane fuel and with ethanol blends up to 30%. We also require new refueling infrastructure to be compatible with, with higher blends. Um, this really helps build on, on the investments that are already being made in infrastructure um, because a, a lot of the new pumps and, and other infrastructure going in is already warranted and designed for these higher blends. That's something you know, really want to future proof the, the infrastructure that, that people are, are installing now. Um, and then we also kind of the bill also would reestablish credits for, um, for, for flex fuel, fuel vehicles that automakers get. Um, and really kind of helps put more vehicles on the road that, that are capable of, of, higher, of, of handling higher blends of, of, of ethanol, E85, but also these mid-level ethanol blends as well. So those are kind of the, you know, kind of the more, more specifics of the legislation. Um, but, but again, you know, I think really the, the big picture here is, is really how do we be, you know, forward thinking, building on the success of, of the RFS, and, and really looking at, you know, how do we modernize um, gasoline um, by, by allowing uh, additional ethanol content, requiring a higher octane value that really takes advantage of, of, the, um, of the efficiency, lower emissions and, and better affordability that, that ethanol is gonna bring, um, you know, to the gasoline supply going forward. So that's that's a that's a lot of information. I know, kind of an overview. I you know I know some of you have probably seen you know seen some information here on this before, um, but certainly happy to answer any questions and and have some discussion. Again, really you know really would encourage you to to take advantage of of a lot of those resources um, on on the NCGA website. I imagine there's some on on Indiana Corn as well. Um, you know whether it's some of the some of the videos um, from. On, on the from engine researchers that that really kind of get into the, you know, the nuts and bolts if if you're really into that that side of things, um, you know, just to, to some of our grower leaders talking about the importance here and really some resources that you can use um, when you want to reach out to uh, your member of Congress and and your staff to talk about how this is a a really good a big priority for for corn growers going forward. Thank you so much, Kathy. I know that it's. Uh, very technical. Uh, this uh, this legislation is has been you know several um, a year and a half in the works uh, because it is so technical and it's not you know no surprise that it's going to take some additional uh, discussions with folks to get them 
uh, acclimated to the, the concept. Uh, we've had conversations with our delegation and uh, they've been very receptive. Uh, nobody signed on yet, uh, but again, it is very technical and it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take several touches, I believe, uh, to really get uh, folks familiar with this to where they do feel comfortable. Uh, uh, talking about it and then agreeing to it. Uh, so just, uh, you know, for members, just kind of stick with us. Uh, you know, it's going to be a, kind of, it's going to be a long haul. This is a, this is a big lift. Uh, it's a, like you, like you uh, obviously covered, it's, um, um, uh, you know, it's a new concept. So uh, don't feel bad if you don't really fully understand it yet. Uh, we'll continue to provide information so you can uh, you can adequately uh, advocate for this. And we've, uh, we've had some action alerts that uh, come out from NCGA. We've had several members that have responded to, the, to those. So if you have, thank you. Uh, those do make a difference. Uh, we do hear from uh, the congressional staff that they have heard from our members. So uh, those do get noticed. So when we do send those out, please take a look at it. Consider uh, your response on that. We will do one uh, today after the after the session, we'll send out to members to uh, uh, to con action alert to contact our delegation. So, uh, any I know that uh, don't have a lot of time here, but uh, just Kathy, real quick, is there a kind of a timeline on when would you think it'll be reintroduced in the next Congress? I know we're uh, with any legislation in, in Congress, it's going to uh, the you know the current Congress ends at the end of the year, and then a new Congress will pick up. So. Uh, H.R. 8371 would have to be acted upon uh, yet this month uh, if it were to if it were to pass. So we but there is a full intention to get that reintroduced next year. Is it are we looking at you know, January, February, March? Would it be longer than that? Um, you know, I, I don't you know, I think probably early, early in the new year. I think we'd like to make sure we, you know, have the, you know, work with our, our bill sponsor and, and any other members who, you know, kind of want to want to want to join the party on this uh, to, to try to get this reintroduced, uh, you know, in, in fairly short order. I think that helps, you know, when we want to be talking about this bill with with members of Congress and their staff to really kind of have something concrete to point to. Um, because like you said, this this is going to take a lot of conversations. It's not it's going to take more than one. Um, it is it is a new concept. It's, you know, it's really about, you know, really, you know, ensuring where we've got a good a good looking future ahead. Um, so, so that does take time. You know, I think we are taking some time um, to really make sure we're, you know, hearing from other stakeholders and, you know, and, and if there's some opportunity to, um, you know, kind of bring them along in, in this process, we want to do that. Um, but, but we're not going to, you know, I think we're, we don't want to, you know, kind of drag out re reintroduction too far either. So I think probably, you know, fairly short order in, in the new Congress, you know, to try to um, you know, keep keep some momentum building and, and, and growing. I think it's been, even though this bill was introduced late in the session, it's really helped us, you know, reach out to members of Congress and their staff to kind of start the conversation. Um, you know, even though we knew the bill's not going to go anywhere right now, but it's, it's helped start the conversation. And so we want to be able to pick that up early, early in the next year and, and, and keep it moving forward. All right. Well, thanks again so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking time to be a part of this year's forum and uh, look forward to what we can get accomplished yet this year with this, this bill and then the reintroduction of the next. So thanks again for all that you do for us out in Washington, D.C. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. So next up, we're going to bring in Mike Beard. Uh, he's the president of the Indiana Corn Growers Association. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can't do this this work without your membership and uh, and the corporate partners. And thanks again to uh, First Farmers Bank and Trust and Bain Welker. Uh, but Mike, uh, we need to hear from you on membership. So far away. Can you hear me? That's what I need yes, to know. Yes, we can. Okay. Well, I can't see me, so that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> But thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, you know, you this is this has been a good presentation. Kathy talked to us about uh, a, a new uh, legislative effort. You know, uh, it's it takes uh, uh, it takes a legislative uh, it takes us to make a legislative effort move forward. 
and it takes the membership reaching out to their legislators um, to uh, let them know that they have support in, in their districts uh, for new legislation that will affect the lives of uh, their constituents. And, uh, uh, you know, ethanol exists because of legislative policy, uh, changing to high octane fun funds, uh, to high octane fuels is also gonna require legislative effort. So uh, we need to realize that corn checkoffs, or corn checkoff and soy checkoff funds cannot be used to lobby Congress. So it falls to our membership organizations uh, that we interact with uh, our legislators and regulators to make that happen. And funding for these organizations is voluntary. <clears throat> It's by members and sponsorships. And boy, we need both more of both. Uh, we need the sponsorships for our funding and we need more members to help carry our message. Uh, the, re the members relationship with the legislator is what gets our voices heard. So this is my plea uh, to all of you out there. If you're not uh, a member now, please consider joining Indiana Corn Growers uh, and Indiana Soybean Alliance. Uh, of course, you're going to have to do it virtually, but we've been doing this a, a long time that way. Uh, uh, visit our websites. We've got a special deal for you. We've always got a special deal for you. Uh, thank you uh, all for considering that. This uh, thanks also. I got to say thanks to Steve and Rachel for the the yeoman's job they've done. Uh, They've done, they've done more start and stop, reverse direction, pivot, more times than the Boilers did last night. And I think they've scored a lot of three-pointers too. And, and it, was a, uh, it was a big score day. This was a great, great message. Uh, please, if you, uh, uh, again, the membership message is if you're, if you're not uh, a member now, uh, we, we think there's value in being a member. Uh, Give it a try. Uh, we need you. We need your voice. Thank you, Steve. Well, oh, thanks so much, Mike. Thanks for the kind words. It's a great team that we have here. We couldn't do it alone. We couldn't certainly can't do it without uh, without our members and without our farmer leaders. Uh, you guys set the direction for the organizations. Uh, we just carry out those wishes. Uh, so we we need we need your leadership, and thank you for that. It's been uh, it's been very much appreciated uh, as you've been at the helm of. Uh, the Corn Growers Association. I think we're just about ready to wrap up. We got a, I believe a slide or two yet. I do want to welcome you to join us tomorrow, 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, the main focus tomorrow is grain markets. We're going to discuss an effort to improve the uh, grain indemnity fund uh, the, in the General Assembly this year. So we're going to be joined by Amy Cornell with the Agribusiness, Indian Agribusiness Council. Uh, and then also uh, Andy Tower with Farm Bureau. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Ag Group's efforts to come together and make improvements to the Grain Indemnity Fund. And then we're going to be hearing a, uh, a market update from our own Ed Ebert. Uh, he's going to provide this that uh, general outlook, what he thinks is going to happen with our grain markets uh, going forward in the next uh, few weeks, few few months. So uh, maybe even a, a further outlook than that. But uh, I know Ed has always been a favorite uh, uh, presenter of ours, so we look forward to that. So if you have not registered for that, you have to register for each each session um, separately. So please visit our website and uh, soybeanalliance.com forward slash forum uh, to, to register. Also, uh, Friday, we're going to be, uh, that's our, our final session. Our keynote's going to be brought to us uh, by uh, Nick Welker of Welker Farms, a uh, farmer out in Montana, great, great young uh, guy that's uh, done a lot to uh, share his farming story on YouTube, and it'll just be interesting to see um, how he operates and uh, what his perspective is in, in agriculture today. So that's going to be Friday at noon. Uh, please register for that as well. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, have a great day.